downtown Providence, Rhode Island on a typical afternoon in 1925. Rhode Island's population back then was about a half million people. Half of them lived in Providence. Sports enthusiasts spent their leisure time rooting for the minor league Providence Grays or local college teams. Some followed the Boston Red Sox, who were in the midst of a down decade after winning their fifth World Series in 1918. Back in Rhode Island, the first boys high school ice hockey league was formed, and Judge James E. Dooley of Pawtucket was just months away from closing a deal that would bring professional hockey to Providence. Dooley bought a franchise in the inaugural five-team Canadian American Hockey League in 1926. They would be popularly called the Rhode Island Reds by the locals and Providence Reds by outsiders, and for the next 46 years play in a new 5,500-seat building at 1111 North Main Street, the Rhode Island Auditorium. They started in 1927, and for countless years, this was the show for this state. You know, on game night, you'd see people walking down North Main Street from Pawtucket in blizzards. It was the beginning of a Rhode Island hockey love affair that would last for more than 50 years. The people of Rhode Island didn't go up to see the Bruins. They had the Reds. It was one of the things that they could hang on to year after year. I mean, the, the Pawtucket Baseball teams had come and gone, the Slaters and some other teams had come and gone, the football team had gone. Uh, but this was something that belonged to Providence and they were known as the Rhode Island Reds. The Rhode Island Reds started out as a farm team of the Montreal Canadiens. The Reds finished last in their debut season, but their fortunes would soon change. Four years later, led by a shifty little forward named Johnny Gagnon, the 2930 Club would win their first of three Fontaine Cup playoff championships in five years. Little did loyal fans know that some of the players they were watching would become future NHL Hall of Famers, like 18-year-old Milt Schmidt. Schmidt played just 23 games in Providence before a legendary career in Boston, but the fond memories remain. I was called up to the Bruins, and uh, I played about two or three games for them, then they sent me back here to Providence. It was exciting to, to be on the same ice surface as, uh, as some of those fellas that played in the National Hockey League, like Gene Pusey, who was quite a char character. 1936 was also the year that Providence helped form what would become the American Hockey League. The Reds' popularity soared when new coach Fred Bunn Cook led the club to two more championships capturing Calder Cups in 1938 and 40. A former Central Falls school teacher and later the auditorium's building manager named Lou Peary bought the team in 38. He was a good salesman for one thing and he sold Providence hockey because he was enthused about it. He thought it was the greatest thing in the world. And the locals agreed. Dedicated fans came from throughout the state to support their team on North Main Street, no matter what the conditions. We'd go there on blizzards. We'd have uh, four or five guys in the car, and we'd have to push the car up the hill. The, the driver, the four guys pushing the car up the hill to get to the game. At one time, I believe it was Cleveland. The other team didn't show up till 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Half the people were still there watching the game. And, uh, by the time the, the game ended, those same people were there. I wouldn't say it was a full house, but half of it stayed, half of them stayed. People just used to pack that auditorium. It was just un unbelievable. I, I mean, they were the heart and soul of Providence in those days. What else was there? But for local hockey fans, the Rhode Island Auditorium was their sports mecca. Sunday night games were a happening, just about all of them sellouts, and it would stay that way for 40 years. It was fun. It was wonderful going to the old arena. I mean, we got dressed up and we met a lot of people and we socialized. Sunday night, it was jam-packed to the raft. It's sitting in the aisles. It, it was uh, no heat in the place, the chicken wire, uh, the smoke, it was smoking in the building at the time. It was just a, it, it was something out of, uh, if you saw the movie Slapshot, it was something uh, out of that, out of that venue, you know? As a youngster, it was, it was something that was, was, was treasured. And it was an experience that I couldn't wait to get in the building. And if you wanted to make a bet on the game, well, that was easy. Before the game began, uh, the gambling fraternity would gather in the main lobby, and almost every home game, a representative of that group would come to my office and say, Mr. Duffy, 
Who's hurt tonight? And I'd tell them who's hurt and they'd leave. And you'd walk into the rink at night before the game, like six o'clock or whatever, and these guys are all down there, right? Who got hurt last night? Who's not playing tonight? Because they always wanted the edge for the booker, bookies, eh? I think they almost wagered almost every shot, almost every check, uh, you know, who's going to score the goals. Uh, there was always something. There was always a lot of action going on. The Reds won four Calder Cups from 1938 to 56, led by some of the best to ever play the game, like top scorers Chuck Scherzer, Carl Liscombe, Camille Henry, and Zelio Tapazzini. Tapazzini, or Topper as he became known, was an unstoppable right winger who became the team's all-time points leader and arguably the greatest Reds player ever. Look at all the points he got, the goals he got. You know, he won all the awards that could, you could possibly win here. I couldn't stop him in practice. I mean, he used to laugh at me, you know, he'd come down, he'd do his dipsy doodle and the way he'd go and put it in the net. He, he was a good hockey player, I mean, uh, yeah. But he was, he was a better person, really. And then there were the great goaltenders, Bennett, Bauer, Brimsek, Mayer, and Jockerman. We were getting uh, some of the best non-NHL players to play in Providence, either on the visiting teams or for us. I mean, it was just a great show. A lot of those guys, uh, it's too bad they couldn't have benefited from an expansion, but there were only six NHL teams in those days. I enjoyed it. I, I, my, my first year, I, I played with some great guys. I played with Pierre Briant and uh, Jimmy Bartlett, were two good hockey players, and uh, we were called the B-Line. The fans knew they were seeing good hockey and some great players. Reds were Rhode Island's hockey heroes. These people uh, just love the Reds, and they uh, idolized the players, and it was just so, it was such a close-knit uh, unit. Fans, players, they have you over for dinner and meet their family, and uh, I remember I went to one uh, Italian family's home, and we had something to eat and a glass of wine, and I said, man, that was great. The girl, the lady said, that's only the first course. It was like eight or nine courses, you know. Of course, we were young and in good shape. We could eat and eat and eat and eat, you know. We were heroes, really. You know, we, we, we got off the ice. Uh, they were lined up a mile long, you know, waiting, you know, uh, to, you know, touch you or, or pat you on the back. They were treated like royalty, really. And the players loved them back with a deep appreciation for their passion, hospitality, and loyalty that still stands today. Winning the Calder Cup was a big, big thing to do. Because Lou Perry, I mean, I admired him as, as, a, as the owner, and uh, he was so good to us guys. And the, and the hospitality and the fans that we had here in, 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 in Providence just were with us all the time. Play a lot of different city. Rhode Island is special because people warm. They accept people, you know. I never, I never know anybody, you know. Uh, but to me now, they were really good to me. The last time I played for the Reds is 35, 38 years ago. And still some people go, Bobby LaDuke, oh, yeah, you know, I used to see you play. It's just, it, it, it's mind boggling how some people just remember. Serge Boudreaux. So it should be no surprise that this Rhode Island hockey love affair continues today. The Reds played their last game in a mostly empty Providence Civic Center 31 years ago. Yet thousands still speak fondly of their days rooting for the Reds. Nearly 700 belong to the Rhode Island Reds Heritage Society. And every summer, hundreds reunite with their childhood idols for a weekend filled with rekindling old relationships, reminiscing, and lots of laughter. Hey, hey, <laughs> Hockey fans loved the song, Clear the Track, Here Comes Shaq, as in the colorful Eddie Shaq, who played a half season in Providence. All of a sudden now, Gordy and I are drinking, and he, he, said, he sings his song, Who's the Greatest of Them All, Gordy Howe? And I sang mine, Clear the Track. Here comes Shaq. He knocks him down, and he gives him a whack. And they said, that's what I want to talk to you about. You don't hit me, and I won't hit you. So we shook on it. So many memorable moments. The marvelous players, the championship seasons, the smoky arena, and all the colorful characters. There was something, an aura, in that building that really permeated through the excitement for the fans. Top is in the shoot, just go! Tell me, 
Have your ticket ready, please. The fur should fly when the Barons and Providence Reds tangle. The referee drops the puck, and the game is on. One day they threw a, a little rooster at the, at the blue line. From my net, I went to the blue line. I had to put the, my skate right through it, and somebody had the rope, and he pulled it out. Should have heard the crowd. <laughs> Unbelievable. You can keep the sports parade moving by being a good sport. Good night, everybody.